Hello, everybody, and welcome. Welcome to this wonderful opportunity we have to talk about the science behind Inside Out 2. Hi, everybody. My name is Allison Briscoe Smith, and I am a child clinical psychologist and senior fellow here at the Greater Good Science Center. What we do here at the Greater Good Science Center is we share the research about wellness and how to live a more compassionate and kind life. And we've got this amazing opportunity today to dive into both the science and the imagination behind Inside Out 2. We have three guests with us today. We have Dr. Dacher Keltner. We also have Dr. Lisa Damore. And we also have Marissa Horowitz. So we're gonna have this wonderful opportunity to learn from them as the people who've produced the movie and also the science behind it. So what I'm gonna do is gonna give them an opportunity to introduce themselves and talk a little bit about how they got involved and what their role is in the movie. I wanna give a hint before we, we start this though, that there are gonna be spoilers. So our hope is that you've seen the movie, but we're gonna dive into it and there are spoilers. So if you haven't seen it yet, maybe you know come on back to this later after you've seen it. <laughs> but we're gonna get a chance to hear from folks. I'll get a couple of questions that I wanna ask but many of you, actually close to 800 of you have sent in questions. We're not gonna get through them all, but we're gonna go ahead and get through some of the kind of themes that have come up. So come on along with us. Welcome, good to see everybody here, but let's start off with you, Dacker. We'll start with you, Dacker, and then Lisa and then Marissa to introduce yourselves and to talk about your role with the movie. Dacker, why don't you start? Yeah, thank you, Allison, uh, and welcome everybody. Uh, my name's Dacker, and I'm a professor at Berkeley, uh, faculty director of the Greater Good Science Center, and germane to our conversation today, have studied emotion and been fascinated by emotions, uh, studied in the lab in the lab for 35 years, fascinated by them since I was a child. Um, and I got involved uh, thanks to Pete Doctor, who directed the first Inside Out. Uh, he called me up one day and said, you know, we're making a movie about a young girl's emotions. Do you want to help out? And I, I'm not lying. I thought he wanted to use my voice as a character, which I got wrong. But, um, but he wanted to know about the science, and his team did, Ronnie Del Carmen and others. And and I got involved in the first film because it's this incredible opportunity to visualize, to imagine, to use Allison's word, uh, an understanding of emotion. You know, which I think is core to life, uh, core to well-being not only the inside of emotion, how they influence our memories, our sense of identity, our sense of morality, but also outside, the out of emotions of how they structure social interactions. And that's been a guiding theme of my work. And then with Inside Out 2, uh, uh, Kelsey Mann called me up and Meg Lefauve, uh, one of the writers, a central writer, said, we're gonna start it up again. Uh, this was right before COVID really hit. Uh, you know, what are the new emotions that we can think about as, for an adolescent girl? Riley would now be 13. And that's fascinating because I've always felt that emotions fundamentally are social. Uh, and adolescence, uh, as Lisa has uh, really guided me in thinking, is fundamentally social about situating the self in a new place. And then uh, right away, they said our core emotion, the star is anxiety. And, you know, there's so much anxiety today in our young people, and I saw it as this incredible opportunity to have a, a broad cultural conversation about the anxiety and, and how we're doing. Mm, excellent. And we'll get a chance to dive in a bit more to anxiety and perhaps some of the other characters. But Lisa, how about you and your involvement? Um, well, first of all, just really thrilled to be here with all of you and glad that we have so many folks joining us. Um, so in May 2020, I got a call saying that the folks at Pixar wanted to talk to me and I got on a Zoom because it was, you know, early pandemic um, and I don't live in California <laughs> with um, Kelsey and Meg Lafav and um, Kelsey Mann. And they were holding two of my books. Um, they were holding my book Untangled, which is about typical and expectable development in um, adolescent girls and my book Under Pressure about stress and anxiety in girls. Um, and I have such a vivid memory of seeing them with those books. And we just got going into a conversation about the film, what they wanted to do. In that first conversation, um, anxiety was on the scene. You know, I, I remember seeing sort of like a, a sense of what she was going to look like at that time. She's changed a lot in the in the course of the film. I got a lot cuter 
as the film unfolded, which I think is a really good thing. Um, we had a deep conversation actually that day about perfectionism and perfectionism in girls, especially, and and how, you know, I'm in my clinical practice, how we work with it clinically with young people. Um, and then, you know, I just had the honor of continuing that conversation over four years, made a couple trips out to Pixar. Um, you know, Docker and I saw drafts and and, and gave feedback. Um, I had forgotten about this until the premiere and somebody reminded me, I, I did an hour long presentation for the whole crew on adolescent development and, and what we expect to see and how it unfolds. Um, so it's just, I mean, it's as fun as anything I've ever got to do in my professional life. And, and just, um, I mean, all upside, all upside. <laughs> That's awesome. And again, we'll get a chance to kind of talk about some of these key po points that you've raised up about development. There are lots and lots of questions about is what we're seeing really typical of development? So just a precursor to some of the questions that came up. But Mar Marissa, we'd love to hear from you about your involvement, your role, and uh, how this works for you. And what you were actually trying to accomplish by making this film. Sure. Okay. Well, that's a lot to answer. I'll do my best to be very brief because obviously uh, I'm here to learn from Lisa and Dacker as well. So I don't want to take up too much time, but I'm Marissa Horwitz. I've been the lead editor on Inside Out 2 for the past three years. So um, I came on a little bit actually after Lisa and Dacker were involved because they were involved in this, you know, the script writing phase. And editorial's role in animation is a little different than live action. So, you know, simply we're in charge of putting together all the picture and sound for the movie. Um, but animation works a little differently where we're really iterating and trying a lot of things for the first one to two years. So I lead a team of very talented other editors and assistant editors, and we're recording the dialogue in-house for a while before we get our final actors. We're cutting, uh, we're editing with storyboards for the first year and a half, two years before anything gets to animation. And so we're really kind of crafting the pacing, the humor, the emotion uh, through the edit over the course of those three years. Um, as far as our intention as filmmakers, that's a huge question. Um, you know, I think always as filmmakers, you know, we want to tell a story that people of all ages can connect to that's fun to watch uh, with the legacy of Inside Out. You know, I think in our heart of hearts, we are all hoping to also have a story that could help families, kids, mm -hmm. parents um, have conversations afterwards and maybe just kind of open the door to understanding more emotions. Um, you know, anxiety was always a, a big part of the plan from Kelsey's first um, iterations of the script with Meg. And I also think the other, the big part of what we we're hoping for is right there in our end credits. If you watch our very long end credits, there's a line at the end uh, that says, this film is dedicated to our kids. We love you just the way you are. And I think for Kelsey and Mark, our producer, um, that was always, you know, the heart of what we were hoping to, to say with this movie. Mm. You know, it's a it's such an important message to to have out there, and again, a place that we want to be thinking about what parents are getting from the film. You know, what people how they're receiving it. But Marissa, and you're talking about this. I'm sure there's many folks in the audience, like myself, that were like two years, three years of editing, iterating. So I actually want to come to to Lisa and Dacker to hear you talk a little bit about what did you learn about movie making. We're gonna get to the science, but like this process of iteration. And Lisa, you mentioned you got a chance to train, you know, the, the folks to kind of think about adolescence, but maybe we'll start with you, Lisa. What did you learn about, like, what was a major thing you learned about making a major animated movie? Oh man. So I think probably my exposure, I probably just scraped, scraped the surface of what was actually going on. You know I mean? For as much contact as I had, I, I know I am so humble in the face of the, the extraordinary like scale and talent of of you know the involved in this, um, but one of the things I I noticed between the last draft I saw and the final version was um, there was a pretty significant shift in actually the role of envy and ennui that they that they came much more into the story and and I was like holy moly like how much is on the cutting room floor like that was like. I, I realized, you know, there is just so much that has been made and set aside. Um, I think that was for me the biggest takeaway is just, you know, like what's in the can at the end, you know, maybe this is for all films, but certainly for this film, you know, is like a, a very minority percentage of what was actually created. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, I think it holds the opportunity to think about how much thought and energy and curation really goes in. And again, I want to highlight that in reading the kind of questions, there were lots of super detailed questions. You know, some people had their favorite emotions and want <laughs> them to have more screen time or less. But even <laughs> hearing about this helps us to think about this was a thoughtful curation. But Dacker, what did what was your kind of you you've been through this before, but what did you what did you learn this time around about the movie making process? Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, first is um, how much we need art today. You know, we're a data driven world and there's so much, you know, science, et cetera. And, and you know, I remember uh, and they're just unique powers of art to convey wisdom about the human condition, uh, obviously, that we lose sight of. And I remember, you know, Pete, one of the first questions he asked for Inside Out was like, tell me how many emotions there are. You know, we've got five. You know, what do you think? And I was like, well, there are 23 emotions and let me list them boring in a boring fashion. He's like, Dacker, we need to tell a good story. Like add one emotion to this drama and uh, and that's that will give us because a, a dramatic narrative with 22 characters probably wouldn't work. And, and I think that the second film, Inside Out 2, like to, to convey to uh, a child or a teenager or a parent, like all emotions have their points and their purposes, which we know scientifically is sort of, and, and you convey it scientifically, it's a little pallid or boring, but to show it with the visuals and the anxiety scenes in the film or the, the, the wonderful you know, things that Envy does in the film and to say, this has a place in the human mind. And, and as Marissa said, you know, quoting Mark, like we should love our minds and our children the way they are uh, in terms of their emotional capacities. That's so hard to do with scientific data. And here's a film that reveals the big insight. So it was humbling, you know, like Lisa, um, just to know how much we need the emotions to, to, to art, I'm sorry, to understand things like emotion and consciousness. It sounds like a, a beautiful kind of um, relationship to be able to integrate the art and the science. It's something that I know as a scientist and as a researcher, I don't get a chance to do all the time, but to be able to kind of see it kind of come together in this way. Marissa, I have a question for you. We talked to both Dacker and Lisa about what was kind of surprising about the movie making process. Marissa, do you have something that was surprising about adolescence, about emotion that came through? What what showed up for you on the your learning around the science? Sure, there's there's so much. Um, I also just want to say before we get too far away from what Dacker and Lisa said that um, I was I started as a chemistry major in college, so to be honest, to be able to incorporate some science into filmmaking yeah. was such a joy for me. Um, I know every time I say joy, then it's a pun, but uh, it really was uh, such a great great way to integrate, you know, kind of two sides of my brain that, that have always been very active. So thank you for, for allowing me to be a part of that. Um, you know, I think the more what, when I came on, because I came on basically once a script was approved and I was just voraciously eating up all the interviews and zoom calls that Dacker and Lisa had done with the team and had been recorded and started reading Lisa's books so that I could, you know, feel as connected to the material as, as Kelsey and Meg already did. And, um, it was, I don't have kids, but I actually felt like I was learning more about my adolescent self as I worked on this movie. Um, and and I think being able to really name those emotions that come up during this period, because um, you can feel like you're very alone and, and no one else is experiencing things or seeing things the way you do. And I think just having that touchstone of no, these are regular parts of development and things will feel out of control. Even, you know, the brain under construction, Lisa, which I know is your, you know, a, a chapter title, I think in one of your books or a section title and we, you know, physicalize it. But I think knowing that there's that amount of growth and reworking going on physically inside, is just, um, it's just a great thing to be aware of yeah. as a touchstone. Yeah, and super helpful again for, and you're talking about something that again kind of came up, which is helpful for kids to understand, but so helpful for us as adults to understand about ourselves. Uh, I know that I and many other folks had that moment. I don't, I'm not sure if you all have seen all the memes of the grown ups crying in the show, you know, <laughs> crying as they kind of watch it, but there's, there was something that was important that was being communicated to adults. You all have talked about how, you know, the, the idea is, you know, for adults to know that we love children just the way they are. But did any of you have a thought about what you wanted adults to take away, what you wanted parents to take away? Maybe, Lisa, I'll start with you. What did you really want parents or grown-ups to take away from this movie? So 
Um, you know, my work is on teenagers. And, and one of the things that I consistently learn from parents of teenagers is how isolated and lonely they feel. And it's mm-hmm. what Marissa said, you know, that to see what one is experiencing separately from others and one is anxious about, to see that it is shared, to see that it is natural, um, is an incredible thing. And so there is so much in this film about the normal and expectable events of adolescence. Um I'll give a few examples. Like this is so quick and it's right at the beginning, but it's where um, they're looking at like, what, what's going on with the islands? And like family island has receded and it's tiny and it's gray. And also Riley is standing apart from her parents on it. And Friendship Island is up front, like looking like an amusement park. That is so quick and so funny and so critical for parents to see that there's nothing broken or wrong in their home that their kid no longer wants to tell them very much, is standing separate on this small gray island and really wants to be on Friendship Island. Like, that is so true. But when it's happening in people's homes, they're like, what happened? Or why is, what's wrong with our kid or what's wrong with our family? That, the overnight quality of puberty, the intense reactiveness that we see Um, in Riley when her um, puberty button alarm goes off. Um, The anxiety, I love that scene where it's scanning the face, like let's get another read on that wrinkle in the brow, like that hyper-awareness of social cues. All of that is boilerplate adolescence and all of it I am hearing families think is evidence that something's wrong. And, And so just the gift to put this on the big screen as universal experience, so reassuring to kids, to parents, so essential um, for helping families. Mm -hmm. Decker, I heard you in agreement. Is that aligned with what you were thinking about? Yeah, and you know, Lisa and I have been in conversation a lot about this film together and I could not agree more. I think, you know, our colleague Steve Hinshaw has written about the triple bind placed on young girls. You know, your mentor, I think, Allison, in grad school. You have so much pressure on young people to be perfectionistic and excel in everything. And just to, I think there's a a theme in the film of like calming that down, that narrative in families that parents can be part of. And then just like, like Lisa said that, and I wish I had seen this film when my daughters were young teenagers, um, the emotional chaos that's almost normative of a child entering into adolescence of, and, and I would say specifically panic and anxiety that those are those are very those are part of our evolutionary design they have their point they can get excessive of course but just to be there and to have a language let the child know they're not alone these are common reactions such a a powerful made me cry to think about you know my own past with panic and how it runs in the family and to have some visual tools and wisdom um i hope parents stay close to that i'm hearing over email that it's changed their dynamics with their teenagers, so. Mm-hmm. And, and Marissa, what about you in terms of the hopes that you had that that grownups would walk away with? I mean, I think from the feedback I've gotten from friends and colleagues, it's exceeded any hopes oh. I could possibly have had. Um, I just hearing, yeah, that conversations are happening in families, whether it's around anxiety or self-talk, um, just that parents and families are feeling seen by this movie and, and, and relate to it so much. It's just, it's, really incredible to be a part of that. It sounds like this kind of desire to to normalize is is really, really important. And to see oneself, the kind of the art to see oneself. I thought the visual depictions of things like panic were ones that I my clinical brain immediately went to. This is something I can use in therapy. Um, this is something that I can use for the clients that I work with to help them see. And one of the things that I wanted to kind of lift up and ask as a question is that I, I actually have had previous students who did a dissertation around using inside out to create um, treatment, to create an opportunity to talk about it. We actually got a number of questions um, from folks that are currently going through some sort of therapeutic treatment with inside out to help learn how to name emotions, learn how to feel emotions, which is really quite amazing. I also want to frame, and at least I think you spoke to this as well, we are in a particular time period where um, the struggles of adolescence are are front and fore. 
I, I work clinically very much in the way that you kind of said, where I'm trying to spend a lot of time with parents trying to tell them what is normative. Um, and parents are panicking and kids are panicking and we have a mental health crisis amongst our kids. So I'm actually really curious if we could kind of get specific about what you think, in addition to what you've just talked about, um, how we can use something like this art um, to help help in the midst of all of this. I don't want to put this as like, this is the the thing that will solve all the things, but this is not the medicine that will solve all the things, but something's going on here that is pretty important. So Lisa, I'll turn it back over to you and think about like, what do you think the potential is for how this can be helpful in the context of our mental health crisis with kids? Okay. So there's a couple of things just to state the incredibly obvious, but this is important. Emotions are abstract yeah. as they live in our lives, right? Like they're vague. And we know as clinician that they're best managed if you can share them. So this is, I, I know we all take this for granted, but I think it's actually worth articulating for the film to personify the emotions, to make them recognizable, to give them carefully chosen colors, creates a shared language. And suddenly this abstract thing is no longer abstract. It's a cute little character that everyone can talk about together opens up the possibility of an interaction like this at home, where a teenager is scrolling through their phone, looking on social media, feeling lousy about themselves. And for a loving adult to say, oh, that's making you feel envy. You're feeling envy. Okay, now that can happen. And it could happen before. It can happen a lot easier now. And as soon as that word is shared in that space, first of all, the feeling comes down to size. Second of all, the kid's not alone with it. Third of all, one of our rules, right, clinically, is everything feels better on the outside than on the inside, right? Like it's a sh out in the world shared. That all gets achieved with that cute little character now existing in a shared lexicon. Like that's massive. So there's that. Then the other massive thing, I could go on forever and ever, so I'm just going to say these two things. I can't say enough about how desperately we need as a whole big culture to make normal the experience of uncomfortable emotions, right? We do have kids who are suffering. We do have an adolescent mental health crisis. We also have a grand misunderstanding where we are too often in the headlines equating psychological distress with a mental health concern. They are constantly talked about as though they are the same. You can tell it makes me bananas because psychological distress is natural to being human, a big part of being a teenager. And so we have a lot of kids and a lot of parents who on a bad day are worried that something is really wrong when what they only need to be worried about is how to help that kid feel better. And so the achievement above all of this film is to take these nine characters, only one of whom is pleasant to experience and treat them as essential, natural, necessary, and valuable. And to do that in a delivery device that reaches so many more people than anything we can do as university people, we can do as clinicians. I mean, it is, I, I am so excited about it because like that's the message that needs to happen and this is the right delivery device. That's or I, I'm cheering and ah hawing from the, from the bleachers <laughs> here as another clinician and also as another, as a mom. Um, yeah. and, you know, and as anyone in the space who cares about kids, uh, to reiterate that kind of message and to create a shared language is really impactful. Marissa and Dacker, what else do you think about in terms of the potential for helping address uh, some of the concerns? Please, Dacker. <laughs> I am not the doctor in the room. <laughs> yeah, and but I would love to hear, Marissa, your thoughts about, you know, it, it was such a brilliant and delicate uh, presentation of anxiety and, and panic in particular. And I think, you know, I'll weigh in, but I'd love to hear your thoughts about how you, you approach that as an editor. I thought it was brilliant. Oh. Um, yeah, you know, Allison, um, we know scientifically, um, you know, this. I think this film, and I'm hearing from people from all over the world, they're using this in clinical educational settings, right? Formally and informally. Uh, we know the richer your language of emotion, the better you fare in almost every way. And this film has a subtle distinction between fear, concrete threats to your physical survival, and anxiety, right? Oh my God, I'm imagining what's going to go wrong in my future and my my you know uh, when I go to the party with my friends. That's interesting. I think the vision, the just the like Lisa said, you know, in the science we say, oh, they're the negative emotions, like my favorite emotion, sadness. You know, <laughs> they're not negative. They're not bad for us. You know, for the most part, they're part of 
human nature. And the film is challenging that and, and giving us a new view of, of these emotions. So such, such powerful lessons, um, as Lisa said. But I'd love to hear your thoughts on the editor's view of panic and anxiety, Marissa, how you handled it. It's a hard one, right? I was scared for you guys, like, God, are we going <laughs> to trigger a bunch of panic attacks nationwide? So what do you think? Yeah, it was. It was a really careful balance and certainly something we kept reworking, um, even just anxiety leading up to the anxiety attack at the end, you know, how, where are we dialing her? Because I think, you know, something we took away from what Lisa, you know, talked to us about is anxiety is useful. Anxiety, Lisa, I'm sure this is exactly what you told us, but, you know, we'll help you remember to study for tests. So, you know, you need some anxiety in your life to, you know, to remember to do things like that. Um, but it's when it, it gets out of control that, you know, you need to learn how to manage it and we all need to learn how to manage it. So um, there was a version of the movie that had a, you were with Riley in that panic attack for a lot longer. And it was just, you know, it was too hard to sit with for that long. And, um, you know, you kind of wanted to to give up on, on the movie, you know, uh, before, it, before it could resolve. And so it really was a balancing act and especially interweaving the three kind of storylines, because obviously there's Riley, there's what's going on in headquarters, and then there's out in the mind world. And so that was something we were just constantly checking in on. And that's why we put the movie together, you know, and check in on it as a whole piece so often in animation is, is to make sure we've got that balance right. And that emotionally, emotionally, uh, you know, you get to enjoy these emotions, you get to and understand their value. And, and Lisa, you touched on envy and ennui kind of changing towards, the, you know, in the last version. And that was something where, you know, we had a lot of characters and we wanted to certainly make sure that the joy anxiety rally storyline was working first and foremost um but it was really important to us that every one of their um, these emotions we understood the the positives that they bring you know that envy can be a motivator um and a goal setter which lisa you know i think we chatted at lunch one day because we were really struggling with envy we were struggling how to make her not a one note character and that really helped us lay a foundation of how to write her to 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 see the positive before she kind of gets unhinged <laughs> unhinged about things. So um, so that was you know it was just a constant balancing act, and I'm really happy with where we landed. I think the panic attack feels very real, um, but it it also uh, you know we use the the touch, the sound, the reconnecting with the world, which I know is a strategy for dealing with anxiety. And it was really important. There are a lot of people on the crew who deal with anxiety and have had to learn to manage with. And so everyone brought their own experiences with that in terms of what they wanted to see on screen. I mean, what you all are uh, both speaking to, Immersa, that you're talking about is that you had some inherent trust that kids could be capable of seeing and engaging and managing. And I'm also just curious, like it, that must have been hard or was there pressures in the field even? Uh, in the field, of uh, the field in children's media, to not show distress. Um, was there a pressure around that? What What does it mean to actually be able to show that? Because we do have a culture, I think, that as Lisa's kind of speaking about, um, that I understand empathetically is about should I worry, but doesn't give us the space to say that this is uncomfortable and you'll be fine. So, curious, Marissa, just in terms of what it meant in children's media or media mm -hmm. writ large, what came up? Sure. And I may not know about all the outside conversations going on, but I will say it was really interesting. We do what we call a preview screening, um, usually about a year before the film needs to be show or finished. And so we take the film out to a public audience for the first time, and it's in various stages of animation. And we do a family screening, and then we do um, an adults-only screening. And what was fascinating in the family screening was we then have a focus group with kids and their parents, and the kids could explain what was going on in the movie, got the messaging, I mean, from sense of self, beliefs, anxiety, like they got it all. And then we had the adults only screening. We had a focus group and they're like, well, I think this is too much for kids. I don't think kids are going to understand this. I think it's going to be too emotionally intense. And so it, there is, um, there is an expectation that, that kids can't process or it'll be too much. And, and it's, it's really wonderful to do those family screenings and just see how smart and resilient and, you know, a, a absorbing in a good way kids are, you know, of, of lessons and, and stories that matter to them. Mm -hmm. Lisa, I see you nodding in agreement, wanted to pull you in. Just anything that resonates from, from what she's speaking about? I love hearing it and I'm not surprised. And, and I, I think we, um, I think sometimes, you know, in a well-meaning way, we treat kids as much more fragile than they are. And I think that that can kind of become a self-fulfilling prophecy at mm -hmm. times. And I think, 
instead, I mean, especially in this sort of format where it's, you know, thought through and careful and not overwhelming and um, also beautiful. Like, I mean, I, th I think the art piece is really critical here. Um, you know, kids can handle a lot. And, and the more that we help them to handle, the more capacity they have. Right. And, and that's the goal. Right. Is that we expand what kids can do and give them confidence that when they encounter uncomfortable things, they have the wherewithal to manage it. That's what gives kids freedom. Right. Whereas if we convince them that they can't handle much, they get very constrained in their options. Another beautiful kind of lesson from what was shown there. So I want to pivot a bit because I got selfishly got to ask all my questions, but I wanted to kind of pull from the questions that um, were coming from our audience and kind of pivot a little bit to some of the questions that came up for them. So one of the questions that kind of came up and we'll see who wants to take it first um, is about gender is about this was an examination of a couple different things, a, a girl's experience in a girl's setting that was also brilliant, um, you know, in a social kind of way. But, you know, uh, what does this what does this say about gender? Is this different for boys? How was it different? I know that's a whole nother three hours, but any thoughts about either the choice around sticking with girls and girls relationships or what this might say and how typical this is of kind of boys as well? Does anyone want to jump in on that or I can pick whoever looks at me longest? Okay. I did a chapter on gender and emotions. So I'll just start there. Yeah. But I, I don't want to, um, I think if, if you were to do inside out three with a boy, um, all the same basic emotions would be in it, but there would be a layer about what was allowed to be shared with the world outside. Um, like maybe more so like a bunch of like cops, you know, characters who um, do not permit <laughs> exposure of vulnerable emotions. Mm -hmm. um, to the outside world, right? So I, there's this whole other uh, kind of policing, literally, you know, to use cops that boys do with themselves and one another around what's allowed to be shared. Um, I think the social landscape would look different too. Um, you know, the ways in which boys relate to each other and ways in which they connect, you know, um, very much conforming to a lot of these rules, very painful um, often for boys. So, um, there's a lot that's universal here and there's a lot that is pretty girl specific, I think. Mm -hmm. Marissa, maybe you can talk a little bit about the decision that was made or the decisions that were made to really focus in on girls. Uh, I, it's funny, after our very first screening of the movie, we did get a note of like, why can't this be about a boy? <laughs> and uh, and I think uh, even all the men on the crew were like, oh, teenage boy brain, I don't, do we wanna get into that? <laughs> um, but you know, and I, I just have to say that the women on this crew, you know, um, we had a we started the movie with a storyboard artist team that was half female, which I had never been on before, which was amazing. Uh, my editorial team was also, you know, gender split, um, you know, and and sometimes majority female, depending on who was there. And so it was really great to be able to have conversations about the creative content and make sure that it was feeling true to um, a girl's experiences, as, as well as even the characters. It's something that, you know, I think Brie, Riley, Grace, making sure they had kind of unique first personalities and responses to things, because sometimes it can, um, you see a gaggle of girls and they all just seem like they're laughing and, and the same. And so it was something that we all really kept advocating for to have, make these girls distinct, but also a universal universality correct me on my words, sorry, doctors. Um, <laughs> um, but basically just a common experience um, that even that, to be honest, I think having a unique personality within the girl makes it feel more universal because you know, it's a, a real character, not just a, a shell. Um, I don't know if that helps answer the question, but that's what I got. <laughs> it totally helps answer the question and also gives a little bit of insight as to how this process was done. And, um, and you know, the desire, like, we don't have to do all the things with one movie. You all did did a lot, which makes me actually ask the next question, which is going to be for you, Dacker, um, which is in taking a look at many of our questions from our audience, many of them know and love you, Dacker, for all the work that you've done on thinking about emotion, writing about emotion, but also most recently on awe. And we got a lot of people fighting for awe. Where was <laughs> awe? What's the role of awe? So I was really curious about how, how did you think about awe in this movie? Did you see on this movie? But maybe you could talk a little bit both, you know, for audiences that are not quite familiar with the role of awe. Maybe you could talk just a little bit about where awe might might be 
for adolescents. Yeah, you know, it's it's almost like uh, the the Peanuts cartoon strip where Lucy holds the football for Charlie Brown and he comes running in and she pulls it away and he falls. And that happens to me with, you know, when Pete for Inside Out, it's like, what emotion would you add? I was like, it's got to be awe or compassion, awe, the feeling of wonder about things that are mysterious. Einstein, it's a basic human state of mind. Compassion, the central ethical emotion in human evolution. My lab's devoted and, and they haven't made it into the film yet. <laughs> um, but it's interesting, you know, it's a it's almost a question for Marissa, because when you watch the film, you know, and Lisa referred to the beauty of of Inside Out. These are beautiful, beautiful, compelling films. There's not only awe in the, the visual representation of Riley's mind and her social life in so many ways. And that's important, right? We can have awe towards our minds. It's all, they're also full of another emotion that hasn't made it yet, which is love, love and compassion, that we love her mind and the interactions between the emotions. So I hope someday you know, those three emotions will be part of it. I, you know, I love Lisa's speculations about the boy version. All love, compassion feels like 17 years old, 18 years old. Um, so I have hope and I'll keep pitching. Um, but what do you think, Marissa? How would you add emotions or or? How, how do these transcendent emotions figure in the film? Sure, and I will say we did briefly have awe in the movie and I'm sorry that awe didn't make it. Awe came in in the epilogue scene um, and looked a lot like Dacker in our storyboard version. <laughs> um, so uh, so maybe, maybe for the next one. Um, as far as compassion goes, it is actually something we talked a lot about with Joy that uh, we kind of wanted to show an evolved Joy in this movie that she starts from kind of a childlike Joy and that what we were hoping came through is that a compassionate compassion was part of, of joy's evolution, that, that she is a compassionate joy as well. So um, not that it can't still possibly be its own character, but it just, it was a, a topic of conversation and love too. You know, love has so many forms. Um, it was a hard, that one was a hard one for us to figure out the place in this movie, but um, it's certainly on all of our minds. <laughs> I think there are ways in which they, they were kind of the implicit, um, emotions that were there because I actually saw awe sneak in there a couple places just kind of these kind of moments and, and pieces and I actually really saw the end as being about self-compassion um, so one of the things we do a lot here at GGSC and have kind of uh, given people opportunity to learn about is self-compassion because when we think about it this was all stuff that was going on internally the the ability to actually think about I am good enough or I am possible, you know, those kinds of pieces of self-compassion. So, you know, maybe it's an opportunity to think about how they're there, just not writ large in the characters, but also the opportunities. I know that I and my kids hate this. Like I went on my lecture to them after they watched the movie about like in self-compassion, but there might be these kind of opportunities to kind of to think about that as present. But, you know, in thinking about this incredible iterative and editing kind of process, I also wanted to think a little bit about um, and I'll turn to you, Lisa, for this. Like, were, were there things around adolescence that you felt clearly you couldn't do it all, but big pieces that weren't there that you had hoped for or want to make sure that get there in some kind of conversation? Was there was there a thing? This is a couple of questions that we got around this is like, how much is this aligned with the science? So I'll turn to you, Lisa, and to, to think about that a little bit. So. Um, adolescents are complicated. You cannot capture all of them. Things that Inside Out 3, if it continues with teenagers, might pick up risk-taking, right? Pushing boundaries, doing things adults don't want you to do um, as a job of teenagers. Um, more direct questioning of authority. You know, the teenagers, you know, really starting to poke holes in the adults in their world push back much harder on what adults are saying and doing um is is all natural to teenagers romance right that um that begins in adolescence whether it's acted on or not but like you know powerful romantic feelings are a big deal um i i think you know so like i could go on and on it but those are three things that are, like when i think about like the landscape of what it means to be a teenager risk taking <laughs> pushing back on grownups, starting to love life in one form or another, like there's room to room to grow here. Mm -hmm. 
room for the multiple multiple iterations. I'm looking forward to Inside Out 47 when we do <laughs> pause. So let me know when that's coming. But you know, the, there's a lot that we can kind of um, cover and see here. And, and there's an opera. There was actually ex specific questions about the types of theory that were used um, and were used to kind of whether it's emotion focused kind of theory or adolescent development. So one of the questions that said, states here is like, were there specific psychological theories or research that influenced the development of the storyline? And so Marissa, you hinted at you wanted a more grown up. Don't, don't worry, I saw that look. We'll, we'll go. <laughs> you wanted a more kind of grown up joy. But I am curious, again, for Dacker and Lisa, maybe Dacker, we could talk with you a little bit, a chance for us to kind of step into our, our academic spaces a little bit. But what type of science did you lean on? What type of theories did you really lean on to present? You mentioned some of the emotion kind of piece. But, you know, I was really interested, for example, with the kind of visual scanning of the eyebrow, I thought immediately of Ekman. Like, was that, you know, looking at what was there? But Dacker, yeah. maybe you could talk a little bit about the types of theories that you really wanted to offer or or offer to the group as they were making this happen. Yeah, I mean, and and the the whole the two films could you and you know we should teach a class in university settings because it it's got all the science of emotion in it, from you know the corrugator muscle movement that goes up and down to that they playfully make fun of this you know this you know, just how significant it is, to little vocal bursts to. They, had, they literally would ask questions, you know, as the films unfolded, like, well, if dopamine is part of joy, what what would it make the hair look like and the skin look like? And I'd love to hear Marissa's thinking about the visuals of of the different emotions. Um, but, yeah, theoretically, you know, the the and it's fascinating because the, the two films follow the arc of emotion science, which is. We began with the Ekman emotions, basic emotion theory, kind of the centerpiece of emotion science in some ways. Five emotions, you know, anger, fear, sadness, disgust, surprise, joy. Surprise didn't make Inside Out one. And the field has evolved as the films have evolved. And so when I visited them, one of the first presentations to Kelsey and Meg was kind of a lot of new work on 25 emotions, uh, new computational approaches, if you like that term of you know, which we do in our lab, Alan Cowan, like, wow, there are 25 emotions. They're all blending and mixing and changing and evolving. And joy has many different facets, which we see in this film. Uh, and, and it's a much richer space that that I thought the film, this Inside Out 2, nailed it, right? What are the emotions we should privilege for a 13-year-old? The social self-conscious emotions, right? Uh, and that's true scientifically. So they... You know, they got the broad theoretical arc of kind of the evolution of emotion, how there are many more than what we used to think about. And then they got a lot of specific, you know, I would get emails regularly of like, how does emotion influence, you know, the sense of memory or with anxiety? What are the data on what does it do to our sense of the future? And there are studies showing if you feel anxious, you think you're more likely to get hit by lightning, <laughs> you know, which is ridiculous. But that's what the state is like. So it, it was it just covered the full range of theoretical perspectives in the field. Mm. And, and Lisa, what kind of theories did you lean on, research did you lean on? Clearly the research body that you've produced, but what did you kind of lean on or share with folks? See, like the two big things that were it's you know, I don't want to, I don't always know how much my influence is really there, right? Because like what I'm working on is like the shared body of knowledge, right? And I distill it, but I don't want to take credit like, oh yeah, this was my, you know, but like for what it's worth. So there were two things where I was like, those were conversations we had. One was the resolution around um, allowing shortcomings to be integrated into the sense of self. Um, I, I remember from our first conversation um, in that conversation about perfectionism, I remember saying, and this is actually the work of Nancy McWilliams, who's a psychoanalyst who does beautiful clinical work. I remember quoting her to Kelsey and, and Meg because they were talking about it. I was like, well, do you want to know what we do clinically? And and she, they were like, yeah. And, and they said, you know, our job as clinicians is to help people um, acknowledge their shortcomings while still hold themselves at a reasonable level of self-regard. Like that's the that's the target outcome. And that, I think those are Nancy's words, like almost perfectly. So that it was so fun to watch that, you know come into being. And then it is such a quick little scene at the end, but I was like, oh yeah, that's that, that's familiar. 
is at the end when they're like, anxiety, here's your chair, sit in your chair. <laughs> and then, and she's like saying all of this stuff that's excessive, right? All of this like irrational anxiety, overestimating the threat, underestimating the ability to deal with it. And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then she goes, but I have that Spanish test. And they're like, bingo. And I was like, yes, that's where anxiety is exactly doing her job. And so I think, you know, for me, it's really those clinical pieces around, um, we don't fight emotions. We just help people try to bring them in and keep them where they belong and put them to use. Um, but we're not in the business of banishing or preventing any of this. And um, and so those were a couple of the places where I, I felt like it looked awfully familiar to the way I think about things. It's it's also another piece, like I, I wonder if what you're saying by saying this and also what the movie is saying um, is allowing, a, it's not explicit, but let me make it so, is telling folks what we do as a therapist. You know, I think a lot of times kids, well, kids don't come to me, kids get sent to me. So that's, there's that. Um, but parents come to me with a desire to get rid of the bad thing. Um, and I teach people how to live with the thing that's already there. Um, so there is this kind of way that your the movie really allows for the nuance. Like the, one of the couple questions about seeing joy cry. Um, what does that mean, except for the complexity that you're talking about, you know, uh, Dacker, what you're kind of referencing there. But uh, there's a secret way that this is actually talking about, I think, what therapy can can do um, and also maybe helps me in my job, which is like my job isn't about getting away of the bad things. It's about right sizing. I have to say that I yelled out loud in ways that embarrassed my children when I saw <laughs> when I saw anxiety in the chair. Because it was still there, had little anxiety tea. It was right sized, right, and that there was a function for her, um, and it was like yes. But you know, you've both talked about these kinds of theories, clinical theories, and emotion theories. And curious, Marissa, you know, as much as you saw or heard, you know, how that impacted the characters, like the size and shape mm -hmm. of embarrassment, which I loved. You know, the can you tell us a little bit about? how that came about or were there was there these theories were impactful for that or the shine of joy's skin <laughs> Those, sure. you know were there things that came up around that sure i mean and i have to say just every conversation that was had with lisa and decker like it just it kept coming around you know in different meetings obviously like the film just really evolved over time but we kept kind of going back to those morsels that we all connected with um even if we didn't know the right name for the theories um i will say like even from the first inside out a shape language for the emotions was very important to the filmmakers so like joy is a star shape like her her uh, emotions are you know her emotions are big um sadness is a teardrop uh, fear is an exposed nerve. Uh, and so I think, you know, that was taken into consideration when developing the, the new emotions. Like, I love that anxiety's hair is as emotive as the rest of her. Um, it changes with, with her state of mind. Um, embarrassment, the, the character, the emotion that wants to be seen the least is the biggest. Um, <laughs> so, you know, obviously envy being small and just, you know, wanting more from the world with these big eyes and her eyes, her eyes are the ones that change the most. She can get these anime eyes um, and stuff. And anyway, I just think the characters department did an amazing job really uh, giving life and shape to, to the emotions that we know. Mm -hmm. You know, we have this opportunity as well for, for you all to ask questions of each other. Um, so I am curious, like, are there burning questions that you have for each other? It's been maybe a minute since you've seen each other, the movie's come out, but, you know, Dacker, Lisa, Marissa, do you guys have questions of each other? Well, I have a couple things that my kid noticed. I have a 13 year old um, and none of this is accidental, but I'm just sort of like, I'd love to know a little bit more of the backstory. So two things. One is, you know how we get those into the mom's mind, into the dad's mind. So my 13 year old daughter was like, did you see that sadness is in the central spot in the mom's mind and anger is in the central spot in the dad's mind? So I'd love to hear a little bit about those conversations because I know that is no accident. And then the other thing, which I had totally missed, was she was like, mom, do you see that one of Anwi's socks is not all the way on? And it's true. It's like one sock is like only pulled up. I was like, holy moly. So like, I just love to hear more about like how all this comes to be. 
Sure. Yeah. And we just can't be bothered to pull up all of her socks away. I mean, it's, you know, it's teens who have a shoe untied all the time as they're walking around, you know, it's, it's that feeling. Um, and her attachment to her, her phone is, is very resonant, but actually I'm hoping Dacker can talk a little bit more about the mom and dad's mind, central emotion, just because that was all decided on the first movie. And we kind of carried that through to this one. Um, so yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, the uh, we did talk, you know, there are a couple of nice reviews on gender differences and, and Lisa's surveyed that literature, too. And, you know, one of the reliable wins is women cry a little bit more, you know, and that's one of the only physiological differences in the emotion world for gender and men get a little bit more angry, you know. And so I think, you know, despite the tremendous overlap and those emotions for women and men and, and uh, people of different gender identities, there is that difference that speaks to people, uh, speaks to family dynamics, um, and I thought manifest in the film. And, and I guess, you know, to your prompt, Allison, my question for Marissa, I am astonished. It's, a, you know, you talked about the storylines and, and the way that the film not only goes from one person's mind to another, which is incredibly hard narrative wise, but goes from inside to outside, you know, and how, I, I mean, I can't even begin to, that's what emotions do is guide your mind and guide your behavior. How did you guys do that work as you put together the film? Yeah. And that was something that really, it just never stopped from day one till, till the final picture in terms of finding that balance. I will say that um, the first versions, we were learning way too much just in the outside world, because it's easier to tell the story there. And we learned that it's a lot more fun, as much information as you can get inside Riley's head uh, to experience it through the emotions. Like that's where we, we want to be as much as we can. But we also realized that compared to the first one, we needed to be with Riley a little bit more in, in this movie because they are kind of social relating emotions, you know, these outward facing and self-conscious emotions. And so you did need to fully understand the social situations she was in to be able to like really relate to the emotions and why she made the behavioral choices she did. So um, it was really a constant, you know, reworking, rebalancing. Um, you mentioned actually the kind of CSI, like going into Brie and Grace's head, you know, with Riley when they're noticing what's going on in the car. And that came to us actually really late. We had uh, told that scene in a, in a kind of more traditional way, but only going into Riley's head and none of the like lighting effects or fun CSI stuff. And I think uh, we were kind of regrouping after one of the internal screenings and Pete and Kelsey were talking about like, oh, we'd love to have the feeling of that dinner scene from the first movie where you go into dad's head and it's got a very like military feeling. What's the equivalent for, for teenage girls? And I was like, well, I feel... I think I'm, and again, I hesitate to take credit for anything because these discussions keep going on for years and years, but I do kind of remember saying, well, girls are like detectives, you know, like you know, crime investigate, you know, like that level of detail of like pinpointing expression changes and, and the micro changes and everybody. And so um, storyboard artists and writers took it, took it and ran with it from there. And, and it became this really fun, I think, dynamic scene of going into each of their heads and getting to experience it. But um yeah, it, it's just a lot of trial and error, to be honest. Well, I think, again, what you've kind of elucidated is it's a lot. <laughs> it's it's a lot of that. And that, I think it also just shows how much heart and intention and love has to go behind um, creating something um, to to show this this story. And again, I, there were hundreds of questions that were uh, that we got that were really detailed about like why this choice versus that choice. And I think we couldn't answer all of them here, but we can kind of talk about, wow, this took a long, long time. And there were lots and lots of choices and lots of people involved. But, you know, that kind of last kind of line of, of offering what I'll say is love uh, and loving the person just as you are uh, really took a lot of work to, to really show. You know, I, I am really curious as we do one kind of last round, if you all could just think about like, what's something that you're most proud of um, in this work uh, for you to speak just a little bit about that, something that you're most proud of, like as you got a chance to be part of this process. So to give you a little bit of kind of prep time, I'll go with Dacker, then Lisa, then Marissa. So now you got a couple seconds to think about it, but just, you know, what are you most proud of and what do you hope people take away? So Dacker. Yeah, um, I you know I'm proud that uh, a, 
uh, weird science. You know, I think Lisa talked about emotions being vague and tricky phenomenological experiences is you can see it and it's beautiful and it's powerful and it's dramatic and there are narratives to it. But I, I most, um, you mentioned the word, Allison, self-compassion. Uh, you know, I'm around young people all the time. It's an, the, young people are incredible today. They're, they're smarter, they work harder, they do amazing things, and they're more self-critical than probably in any time in human history. Uh, and, and this film, and, you know, Lisa and I brought that concept to, you know, Kelsey, like there's Kristen Neff, Greater Good Science Center, self-compassion just being kind to the self. And I feel like the ending unfolding uh, and, and the revelations about embracing all the complexity of ourselves and loving that is, is one of the great moments uh, in Pixar film and film. And I'm really proud. I hope, I hope, I think a lot of young people are watching that and parents and it's sinking in. So I'm very happy about that and proud. Thank you. Lisa, how about for you? hard, right? I, I feel like it's just been an honor. Like the whole thing has been a huge honor. And um, the, it's it's incredible to me that I did anything that um, warranted getting to hang out in this crowd with these geniuses and to see how far they can take a pretty straightforward conversation and, and turn it into this extraordinary thing. Um, so I don't, I think I feel proud by association, right? Like just to like get to be part of something that, um, you know, we become psychologists to be useful and um, to have, even if, if I helped at all, right? The scale of utility here and then the timing, you know, about well, how badly we need this movie right this minute in, in our world. Um, you know, it's just, it's an honor beyond all honor. And, and I think in terms of what I want people to take away from that is, could we just do a little level setting here about typical adolescence and the nature of emotion? And if we could, if we could come to an agreement with the help of this film that being a teenager is a bumpy, painful process, no matter what you do, and um, uncomfortable emotions are just part of the deal, those two ideas alone would comfort so many people. And, and reduce so much um, unnecessary distress. So, right. you know, any anything I did to help get that idea out, like I, I could basically retire right, right. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you. And Marissa, how about for you? Um, it's so hard. I mean, one, I'm proud of this team, like 500 people worked on this movie and they put so much love and work and, you know, many, many hours into it. And so to see it connecting with people around the world and, and starting conversations and, you know, possibly helping people, it is amazing. You know, I work on animated movies, you know, like to, to have this, this kind of effect and, and get to be able to work with people like Dacker and Lisa and learn from them along the way while we're making a movie. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's phenomenal, but, but really just, you know, so much work and love was put into this movie and it just means so much that it's it's connecting with people. Mm -hmm. it, it certainly has connected with so many folks and I think it also leaves such a profound opportunity um, for the level setting, for the connection. One thing that we didn't talk about that we could do so really quickly is also how funny it was. Um, and some of the kind of not like the self-critical humor that I thought was really amazing. So, you know, there was fun, like ouchy, is my favorite. Um, so I don't know if there were other like things that were just like funny for you that kind of that you want to kind of speak about, you know, what you took away, but you know, it would be incumbent upon us here at the Greater Good Science Center to end with a moment of joy uh, and with the moment of something that just really sparked some joy for you. So any super quick 20 second sparks of joys that you all had, Dacker, Lisa, Marissa? Oh, okay. embarrassing. Sorry. No, go Dacker. Embarrassment was, you know, funny and endearing, and it's an emotion we hate to experience. But it was a, uh, it was really powerful for me. So, um, Lance Splat slash Blade's name alone, <laughs> <laughs> much less his superpower. Yeah, yeah, it was awesome. <laughs> it just killed me. Absolutely killed me. Yeah, yeah. 
I will say like it was a big priority to make this movie funny as well as have heart. And so I was just really fun to be in audiences now and hear people laughing. Um, the vault was definitely Kelsey Mann, our director's favorite scene uh, as soon as we created it. So uh, it was it was a lot of fun to work on. And I just think um, Maya was able to add humor to anxiety and make her a fun character to be with even while she's spinning out of control, which was a real magic balancing act as well. So I don't know. It was a lot of fun to work on. It was a lot of fun to watch. And also even that piece of anxiety was just trying to protect her as being so important. And what a, what a gift you have all given us by, by imparting that message. So the other thing we do here at Greater Good Science Center is um, I just want to end with gratitude. Um, so on behalf of all the folks that are watching, all the people that sent in questions, just really want to thank you each for your thoughtfulness, your heart, your love, your compassion, your research, all the work, the years, the cutting board, all of that. Um, and please know it's meaningful and it's impactful. So thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thank you all for your time and your work and effort. Um, deep appreciation uh, and know that the world's just a little bit brighter because of you all. So thank you all so much. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, Allison.